Let's set up our paper so we can take notes correctly. Let's do use the Cornell note format. Our topics are going to cover the Tang and Song Dynasty, over 600 years of Chinese history. We're going to talk about the Silk Road and how they governed China. We'll also talk about how the government had to shift southward and uh, how life changed for the people in China. Eventually, we're going to talk about the inventions that were created during that 600-year period. And, of course, those inventions, inventions will spread um, across and around the world. Let's take a look at this picture here. Look in the upper right-hand side. We see a large man surrounded by a small group of people. That's the emperor. He's the most important person. We can tell he's the most important person. He's surrounded by important people, and you have to speak to someone to see him. Let's take a look further down, down to the lower left. We have groups of people gathering around. And then finally, the lower right. A small room, some merchants carrying silk, and maybe a princess. Here we're looking at the emperor's palace, and we're looking at what life was like in the Emperor's Palace during the Tang Dynasty. As you can see, it looks like a lot of it was focused on trade. Before the Tang Dynasty, we have the Sui Dynasty. As you can see, it first came back after the fall of the Han Dynasty, 300 years of no China. It's not that large compared to what China is today, but look what happens during the Tang Dynasty. The Tang Dynasty was one of the most geographically extensive empires in China's history. They had the most significant expansion was in the West, which allowed for them to reopen the Silk Road. The Silk Road was a series of trade routes connecting China to Central Asia and the Middle East. It was first opened during the Han Dynasty. Chinese merchants headed west along the Silk Road with caravans of camels and ox-drawn carts laden with silk, porcelain, jade, bronze, and tea. Often selling their goods to other participants in a chain of trade, they would return with glass, rug, horses, silver and gold, gems, and spices from all over the world. To maintain such order over such a vast empire, the emperor relied on a bureaucracy composed of departments each with its own area of responsibility. This fell along with Confucian ideas of social order and respect for hierarchies. During this time, a larger population of educated people would be needed. It was at this time that the scholar class became the new ruling elite. The emperor feared the wealthy aristocracy so in order to control them, he created the equal field system. This redistributed the land. Heads of wealthy aristocracy were only given 1,370 acres. Healthy men ages 18 to 59 were given 13 acres. Everyone now had to pay taxes to the emperor based on land size. This generated more wealth for the government, reduced the power of the aristocracy, and increased the loyalty of the peasants who received land. Emperor De Zhao feared wealthy aristocracy with their armies. Many would often grow tired of imperial rule and broke off to start civil wars. To curb the general's powers, the emperor assigned them to the northern border, separating them from the aristocracy. Here we see the Chinese taking a civil service examination under the watchful eye of the emperor, who overlooks the scene from the pavilion at the rear. Officials of several cities composed essays designed to demonstrate their knowledge of Confucian texts. Unlike the Tang Empire, Song China was limited to China's provinces south of the Great Wall. The greatest challenge to unity during the Song rule involved containing many hostile ethnic groups clustered on China's borders. The primary threat came from the north, where Mongolian, Jurchen, and Jitan constantly attacked the northern provinces and eventually split the empire. 
Northern people from Mongolia and Northeast harassed China's northern border for almost 200 years, eventually breaking through the Great Wall and capturing the capital. The royal family had to flee to the heavily populated Yangtze River Valley. The northern conquerors called the Jurchen stayed north of the Yangtze River and the Song established a new capital in the south at Hangzhou, located on East China Sea. Thereafter, because the north was under foreign rule, government officials came primarily from members of the southern Chinese families. In addition, the southern merchants became very wealthy because northern products like wheat and millet were no longer available, making southern rice crops extremely valuable. It was during this time that, the, that China governed by meritocracy. This is one of their crowning achievements. In the Song meritocracy, bureaucrats earned and kept their positions according to their ability to, and performances. Song meritocracy was squarely based on Confucian traditions, which theoretically required the state's most talented subjects to serve in the civil service. In reality, Confucian-based bureaucracy before the Song had been dominated by the sons of the wealthy, landowning aristocrats and civil servants. This was true in large part because only upper class Chinese society had enough money to spend on private education necessary to prepare their sons for the examinations. The Song Emperor, however, ensured that the most talented Chinese young men, despite their economic status, could become civil servants by seeking out promising students among all ranks of society. Thus, during the Song Dynasty, students showing aptitude were recruited and educated so that they would be able to take the all-important civil service examination. During the Song Dynasty, the civil servants, or scholars, grew to be the most powerful people in the emperor's government. The civil service examination became the most important event in Chinese society. Civil servants were chosen according to the scores they achieved on the exam, also called the ladder to the clouds. The exam was extremely difficult. Each of the four levels of increasingly challenging tests took all day and required superior knowledge of Confucian, classic text, poetry, government administration, and sometimes calligraphy. Most students took the first exam around the age 23, and the few people who passed the final test between 2 to 10 percent of the thousand that took the test each year were usually in their mid-30s. Those who passed the exam were conferred the prestigious title of scholar and could become administration officials, poets, or historians. The Song era saw a rise of the merchant class in Chinese society. In traditional Confucian theory, a merchant was considered lower than a peasant or an artisan because the merchant neither worked the land or created a product. He was considered a parasite living off the work of others. But the Song government realized that wealth could be raised by taxing commerce, so trade was encouraged both in China and overseas. A new strain of faster growing rice imported from Cambodia doubled China's output of grain, allowing for surplus stock that could be traded to bring in extra wealth. This extra income allowed more merchants to enter the lucrative overseas trade. During the Song Dynasty, a new and vibrant form of Buddhism called Chan became popular across East Asia. In Japan, where it became quite prevalent, Chan is called Zen. Chan stresses potential enlightenment not through study of classical Buddhist texts, but rather through intense, quiet meditation called Zazen. The Chan sect was a small one that appealed primarily to the elite who could afford the time to meditate and to retreat into the world of contemplation. Chinese Buddhist monks were attracted to Chen because of its simplicity and because it could easily be combined with Taoist ideas. Chinese Chan monks transported Zen teachings to Korea, Japan, and the religious connection became a path of cultural exchange between East Asia and various cultures.
Innovations in Chinese technology, in part made possible by the Stable Song government, led to the invention of printing, which increased literacy and the ability of books, and created other new products such as copper, paper money, and expensive art objects. These products, along with traditional Chinese goods such as tea, coal, porcelain, and especially silk, became very popular in Korea, Japan, Persia, and the Arab world and East Africa.